Today's guest comes from one of the largest producers of plant-based meat products before he started his own company that really focused on how to get to people before the butcher. He's the creator of the first family of plant-based burgers, plant-based eating advocate, and he's a visionary behind it before the butcher's uncut product line of four retail and 12 food service meat alternatives that look cook, and taste like their animal-based counterparts. Stick around because you're in for a great treat when you hear Danny O'Malley of Before the Butcher. Welcome to the Vegan Visibility Podcast Show, where your host, Kathleen Gage, shines the spotlight on vegan and plant-based businesses and entrepreneurs from all walks of life committed to cruelty-free eating, healthy lifestyles, animal compassion, and the environment. Enjoy the show. Okay, so Danny, it is so great to have you on the show. And, uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna do this for the Vegan Visibility Show because it's all about business, it's about marketing, it's about uh, really raising awareness around vegan and plant-based businesses. So let's start with you telling us how you went plant-based, why you went plant-based, and what keeps you there, and then let's move into your business. Sounds good. Kathleen, thank you for having me on the show to start with. I appreciate it. Um, and I, I, I can tell you, um, my background is interesting. Like I think most uh, people that are plant-based or vegan uh, have an interesting background. I, I, I grew up in the Midwest, so I was a meat and potatoes boy. And I've got six brothers and sisters. So we sat at a table with nine people and all the food in the center of the table and you better eat and better eat quickly. And um, so I, I, I moved out to California when I was still a teenager, uh, Santa Barbara of all places. Tough move going from Milwaukee to Santa Barbara. You know what I'm saying? But it was a huge eye opener for me. For me. You know, back then, <clears throat> I'm not talking that long ago, but long enough ago, uh, during the winter, we didn't have in the Midwest uh, the fresh fruits and vegetables that we get out in you know Southern California. I think it's a lot better today than it was back then. Um, so I, I started learning about fruits and vegetables, especially that I didn't even know back then. I didn't I, I didn't know what an artichoke was. I I I'd never had an avocado. And, uh, you know, I moved out to Santa Barbara and I was living where we were growing avocados in our backyard, basically. And so it was, it was a huge eye opener. Um, and it was really exciting to be able to try different uh, plant based uh, variety of foods that I, I wasn't really exposed to in the Midwest. Um, so I guess that was the start of my journey. And it, it took a little while before I actually got to the point where I was 100 percent plant based. Uh, but probably over a three or four year period of time going back almost 10 years ago, mm -hmm. I, um, I, I'm going to say I almost unintentionally moved my way uh, away from animal-based proteins. And I started with, with beef. Um, I just didn't have the, the same desire uh, for it. Um, it was more of a taste thing at the time. I just didn't have that desire. And, uh, you know, and I kind of worked my way into just poultry and uh, seafood, love seafood. But it really was about six years ago, I guess now, uh, that I was at uh, the gym with a buddy of mine and, and another friend of mine actually owns the gym. And uh, my good friend um, was really challenged a little bit by weight. And, and we thought, hey, we're going to put together a 90 day program and get you know, you know, get really physically fit and work out five days a week at least and, and eat healthy. <clears throat> well, by that time I was already eating uh, pretty healthy. I was uh, what we would uh, call a pescatarian. Mm -hmm. um, it's still eating a little bit of dairy, but mostly just seafood and, the, and then the plant-based diet in addition to that. And he challenged me. He said, hey, Danny, why don't, uh, why don't you, uh, you know, go 100% plant-based or vegan for this next 90 days? And uh, it was an interesting challenge because I was really doing it for him, not for me. And uh, so if you challenge me, and I think, Kathleen, you're similar to me, you give me a challenge and it's something that's reasonable, I'm going to do it and, and I'm going to get it done, right? So I said, okay, I'll do it. I went in to see my doctor because I wanted to get checked up, uh, you know, get my blood work done, especially my cholesterol. So throughout my adult life, I've always had borderline high cholesterol. 
And my doctor, uh, I, it's, it's one of those things, Kathleen, where you kind of dread. I was like, oh, God, I don't want to go in to see my doctor because I know what he's going to say. He's going to say, Danny, you're borderline high. You got to think about getting on some satins, right? And I, the last thing I wanted to do would get on some drugs. I, I'm a pretty healthy guy. So I went and got it checked. Same thing. Borderline hell high on, on the cholesterol. And I said, okay, uh, I'm going to do this for 90 days, 100% plant-based. Uh, working out, staying healthy during that time, and then go back in after three months and get it checked again. Um, and, and I'll tell you, I, I, people ask me all the time about when I made that transition and I'm talk, wor working through that right now with you, wh why I did it. Um, <clears throat> but I always tell people, I said, look, first of all, you got to do it for yourself. Don't do it for anybody else. And second of all, plan for it. You, you can't just go cold turkey and expect your body to respond accordingly. You have to make sure that you're providing the nutrients that your body is expecting and has had in the past. Uh, so I, I literally did meal planning. I, I planned my meals uh, every week for three months to make sure that I was getting the protein I needed, the vitamins I needed, that I was filling the needs of my body. Remember, I was working out every day too. So I, I needed a little bit more than somebody that would be uh, less active. Mm -hmm. So 90 days goes by and I go back to my doctor and my cholesterol drops 70 points. Whoa. Yes, that is huge. So I went from borderline high to really in the pocket where I was really at a very healthy le level for my cholesterol. Ironically, uh, you know, I truly believe that it was hereditary. Uh, you know, my dad has been on satins for 30, 40 years. My, my brothers are on satins. I think even my sister is. Uh, my grandfather, my great grandfather died in their mid 60s from mm -hmm. heart attacks, which back then they didn't really understand cholesterol the way we do. So we attribute it to that. Um, diet is a big thing. And you know, it was I, have, I have to stop you there and, and share that just before we had this conversation, I was actually talking with my mother-in-law about this, about um, we, we were talking about uh, the, the COVID situation. That is a big discussion for a lot of people. And I said, you know, it's unfortunate that people don't really go to the foundation of their health because that would minimize their risk. You know, that was my comment. And I said, it's kind of like with diabetes and heart disease. I said, where do you think that actually comes from in a family uh, line? And she goes, well, it's hereditary. And I said, it's hereditary based on what's on the end of your fork, what you were taught to eat. And they're finding that, you know, there's a lot of studies going on that find that what we have been taught to eat has more to do with our health than often our genetics. And, and so that's kind of um, shattering the myth that we have no control over our health and we have to go on drugs. And it really is about taking more control, which actually leads into the, the whole question. And I wanna get back to what you do for your working out because you're in great shape. I can tell just by looking, you know, it's funny, you can tell by looking at somebody's face and, and kind of their shoulders and their neck, if they're in good shape or not. And, if they put effort into their health and you obviously do. But before we talk about that, I want to talk about Before the Butcher. That's a real interesting name for a company. When did you start Before the Butcher and what is Before the Butcher? So I, I to backtrack just a little bit, I, I, I worked for the leader and innovator in, in the plant-based meat world uh, beyond meat for three years. And I, I left there after three years to start before the butcher back in September of 2017 um, for various different reasons. Uh, not that I didn't appreciate working for such an amazing company. Uh, I just thought that there was a lot of room out there for other companies to do similar things. And there was a need for it. Uh, you know, just because there, there seems like there, there's uh, room for something doesn't necessarily mean that there's a need for it. And there's certainly, as we know today, there is a great need for these type of products. So before the butcher, um, look, when you're starting a company, one of the first things you do is, hey, what am I gonna call this company, right? And, um, you know, we, we thought about it as a team and we, you know, we, we had, I don't know, Kathleen, a hundred names, let's say. I mean, an unbelievable amount of names and we're just trying to work our way through. And one day I was sitting with the team and I said, guys, let's really backtrack and think about this, right? And, and what does the average consumer do when they go into a grocery store and are thinking about, you know, getting some meat or some animal protein? What do you do? You, you walk over to the butcher department, right? 
Well, what would you do before you go to the butcher department? And we, we want people to think about plant-based before you go to the butcher department. And that's how Before the Butcher came about. It was really that thought process. Hey, what about if you think about what you're going to do and why you're doing it before mm-hmm. you get there, mm-hmm. before the butcher? That's okay. how we got to the name. Okay. And, and um, what exactly is before the butcher? What kind of products do you take to market? And, um, you know, what, what are your marketing strategies, things of yeah. that nature? So we started out in, in food service, um, you know, selling to restaurants and, and food service operators uh, across the country. Uh, and, and we focused on that to start with for a couple of different reasons. What for, first is a, a little bit easier entry level for a, a production, uh, a food production company to do so because we don't have to, you know, worry about the packaging and so on and so forth. I mean, literally when you're selling a food service, you can put it in a box and label the box and send it out, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It's it's much simpler than retail where you, you have to really think about what the packaging is gonna look like, what the is, consumer is gonna be attracted to, what the uh, retailer is gonna be attracted to and, and making sure it gets in the right place on the shelf. So we started in food service with, uh, with eight products, uh, which is a lot for a small company to start with and um, mostly ground. So we had, a, we had a, 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 like a ground beef plant-based, obviously vegan, uh, and then an Italian ground, a chorizo ground. We have a, a pulled pork, uh, chicken chunk, um, and a beef tip. Um, and, and these products were really designed to, to make it easier for um, the restaurateur or the chef or the cook to literally just substitute the plant-based product they were using in a recipe. So these were really recipe um, or ingredient-based products that we made at the very beginning that literally, hey, look, if you're making a burrito and you're using ground beef, Mm -hmm. you can substitute that one-to-one with our ground product that's 100% plant-based. And that was the focus from the very beginning was, hey, we've got a simplified we're making some products that nobody else is making on the market at the time that are original and unique, our, our chicken chunk, our beef tip, our pulled pork, which is absolutely amazing. I mean, just a crazy, crazy good product. I, I sampled it at a, at a, at a trade show just a couple of weeks ago, and p- people just couldn't believe it. Uh, it is that close. Mm. And that's the exciting part of, of the industry as well. So we, we spent a, a couple of years uh, forging forward in the um, food service arena uh, mm-hmm. with our products. Um, it, uh, shortly thereafter developed a, uh, I guess in early 2018 now, yeah, because it's been three plus years, we developed our plant-based burger. So we were the third one to come out behind Beyond and Impossible with a plant-based burger. Um, and we did it a lot faster, uh, but keep in mind, they were starting from scratch you know, nowadays, these food scientists and, and these guys that are developing these type, I mean, I have an amazing R&D team. They reverse engineer what they see on the ingredients. Right, right. So it, they, they look at the ingredients and they say, hey, I think I can do this. And then you back it out and then you go forward. So what what took them years to create beyond an impossible, we were able to do in four months and, uh, and go to market with amazing. it. That's amazing. It's, it's amazing. And, and now, you know, there's... 30 plus uh, of those type of burgers on the market between private label and, and branded products on the market today. Uh, we went into retail in uh, 2019, late 2019, uh, and it hit the market fairly strong. And then of course, we all know what happened uh, on March Was there 18th, an event that happened, a worldwide event that happened right around March of 2020? Yeah. <laughs> uh, unfortunately for us, and the challenge for us at that point in time was, we were about an 80, 20 uh, percent split. So we had about 80% of our business in food service and about uh-huh. 20% in retail at the okay. time. And so food service fell off the map. We, our, our largest distributor, our largest customer didn't order from us for two and a half months and we were getting weekly orders from them. Mm. So uh, it, our, our business just dried up overnight. Um, retail, um, we were fortunate to have products on the shelves in about a thousand locations in various parts of the country. Uh, the challenge was, and what's really interesting is you'll, you'll hear people talk about how retail exploded. 
Uh, it did for certain products, mm -hmm. uh, but for other products, um, it, it was a bigger challenge. And, and ours was one of the products that was, was challenging during that time because the retailers were struggling just getting the products to their retail location, the grocery stores and whatever they got there. So they were in trouble too with freight and trucking and moving the trucks back and forth from their distribution centers out. They didn't have enough people to help. And so they were loading the trucks up with the things that they think they needed to send out. And unfortunately for us, a lot of the plant-based items weren't getting put back on the shelf. Right. It was stocked in the warehouse right. and it was empty on the shelf. Mm. Mm. As crazy as it seemed. And then in addition to that, um, nobody was open to talking anymore to us. Everything shut down. So the focus was, hey, we don't have the time to talk to you. We can't look at your products anyways. We can't meet you. We can't do any of this. So hold off. And it was months later when the wheels started turning again. So we, we literally lost, you know, three, four months because nobody was open to talking to us either. Well, let me ask you this. Did you have any sleepless nights over this? You know what? Because I'm plant-based, I'm vegan, I always sleep well. I love that answer because, you know, I've had a lot of people talk about how stressful the last 18 months has been. And, you know, our business, we went through a big uh, transition uh, as a result of the pandemic. I'm a keynote speaker. And so that was wiped off the face of the earth, no conferences. Right. And while people are just like major stressing, I'm continuing to eat plant-based. I, I didn't do any comfort eating with junk food. It was like, I really stayed the, the line with my eating. And I was like, I'm not as stressed as I would have been had I not been eating this way. And I want to remind people that this is Kathleen Gage and you are listening to the Vegan Visibility Show. And it's my good pleasure and my honor to be talking with Danny O'Malley of Before the Butcher. And Danny, I, I want to find out with what happened. You had a four month period where nothing was really taking place. And uh, probably that's a great time to regroup and look at the, the direction you're going. Um, what has been your business growth as far as the number of staff members you have? And where do you see things going now that things are somewhat settling down? We still don't have all the answers, but where do you see things going for the plant-based industry moving forward? Well, um, that's really kind of two questions. So I'll, I'll, answer, I'll answer two parts. Uh, one for us specifically um, we're, uh, in the final stages of building out a 30,000 square foot, uh, facility down in, uh, uh, San Diego, really excited about that because it, uh, it will increase our opportunity to grow, uh, substantially very quickly overnight. Uh, and by September 1st, we should be in there producing our products. So I'm really excited about that. Um, we continue to add new people to our team. Um, because the, the, the growth uh, that we've had recently has been fairly substantial by itself. And a lot of it's coming from the food service area where it dropped off and now it's, you know, picking up steam again. So um, that part of it is, has been just fantastic. It's been amazing for us. Uh, and we, we anticipate uh, that will just be sustainable and, and move forward uh, in a very strong fashion uh, throughout this year and into 20. Uh, 22 as well. I had to think about 2022 because we're in 2021. We lost a whole year and I'm trying to think of what year we're in, right? Uh, so we're really excited about uh, where we're heading. Uh, we shifted a little bit, Kathleen. You know, we were, we had a lot of focus on retail before the shutdown and that was a big focus, branding ourselves in retail. Uh, and during, um, you know, the shutdown, uh, obviously we had a major drop off. Uh, we participated in with a lot of food banks in various parts of the country mm -hmm. donating product. Um, and we're very proud to say that we did that. Uh, part of that was because it was important for us to do it at the time. And also part of it was because we weren't moving product and we, you know, we anticipated like anybody else, we projected what we were going to do and we didn't do it. So we had product that we needed to move and we were very, uh, pleased uh, that we're able to donate during a difficult time for everybody. Mm -hmm. That's um, fantastic. Yeah. And, so, you know, and, and, and with the shelters getting healthier food choices in there, because, you know, that's been one of my frustrations is there's the food deserts, there is the food insecurity that goes on. And if we could take that opportunity to really help people to have healthier diets, I mean, I'm, I'm such a proponent of, of educating people on healthier ways to live. And the fact that it really isn't 
that much more expensive in some cases. And in other cases, it can be a lot less expensive. So good on you. Sure. Good on you. Yeah. It's true. So we we did we did make some shifts. I I, I sat down with my team uh, when we saw what was well, it, you know, backtracking a little bit. We we all thought that this was short term. I I thought we we were going to have to deal with this for a couple of months, not a couple of years, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we we're, we're hanging on. It's hanging on. And after a, a few months, I say, hey, look, we we've, we've got to we've got to take a look at what we're doing and and what we're going to do going forward. So we made some shifts as well, and and we're doing a lot more private label business and industrial business as well, where we provide our product as an ingredient for other manufacturers that make products for. Uh, uh, Costco, Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, Target. So our product is in a, a lot of major retailers, uh, and you may not see our name, but our we're we're out there, and and so that that's really exciting for us. It filled a, a gaping hole for us while we waited for the food service indus industry to, you know, uh, get back to where it was before. It's still not there, but we're working right, on that. Right. So. Well, speaking of where it was and where it's going, what do you see moving forward for the industry? Because one of the things I know is um, actually the vegan plant-based markets have exploded. There's um, headhunters that they only work with people who want to go into those type of companies. There's uh, social media marketers there. I mean, you name it, there, there are people that will fill that gap. And moving forward, there's a lot of people that are vegan that only want to work within that industry. So what do you see for people who really, they want to be aligned with the companies they work with and what their values are? Where do you see everything going? Well, I, I think we're still at the tip of the iceberg, to be honest with you, Kathleen. I think I think there's so much room, uh, you know, even when we look at the plant-based meat industry that, uh, you know, we're so deeply involved in today, um, and, and it's been such a short, uh, you know, life. I, I, I attribute the start of the plant-based meat industry that we're seeing today growing as quickly as it is back to the day that Beyond released their Beyond Burger. So that's about five years ago. And then shortly thereafter, Impossible did theirs. But that was mm -hmm. really the start where people started talking about uh, not just vegan and vegetarian and being um, uh, exclusive to that, but being more open to, hey, plant-based became a word that was much more acceptable. You, you know, right. it, 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 and it's different. It, it's different today too. Look, five years ago, if you said vegan, most uh, you know, animal-based protein eaters or meat eaters would put up a wall right away and say, too radical for me. Um, that's changed a lot in the last couple of years because of the, the athletes, uh, the um, uh, you know, movie stars and television stars who have jumped on board and said, hey, look, this is important to me. I, I'm eating this way. Uh, and, and then people start to look at it. It's a shame it takes that much sometimes, right. but it, it's, it's good. It still happens. Um, and then, of course, the, the, um, uh, the manufacturers uh, that produce animal-based proteins jumping on board, too. When you look at uh, the Tysons of the world and, uh, you know, uh, many of these other very, very large uh, JBS and other very, very large manufacturers or producers of uh, animal-based proteins, either starting their own plant-based division or purchasing companies that are plant-based oriented, uh, the buy-in was huge, was huge. And it, it, that really started with Tyson, you know, buying into, uh, get, buying into a portion of Beyond Meat. Uh, of course, that didn't work in the long term, but in the short term, that was enough for, I think, some of these other very, very large uh, manufacturers of animal-based proteins to say, hey, look, this isn't a fad, you know? Right, um, right. It, This is certainly... Uh, trend. I, I even struggle with the idea that it's a trend. It, this is a lifestyle change that people are making uh, for various reasons, as we know, you know, whether it has to do with their own health concerns, uh, it has to do with the environment uh, and the concerns with uh, global warming and the environment that, that we live in today or, or animal cruelty. Right. Um, there's a lot of different reasons why people make these changes, but people, you know, this is happening from very little, small children all the way up to the elderly across the board. This isn't specific to one generation. It's all generations saying, hey, we need to look at this and well, making personal it, it, decisions, which is important. 
And the eyes are being opened because my my grand nephew was visiting recently. He's 15 years old and he has his eyes set on Oregon, on uh, University of Oregon and Oregon State University. He's a quarterback and really good at what he does. And um, we were talking about improving his performance. And so we watched the game changers while he was here, really piqued his interest. And he said, Aunt Kathy, tell me more. You know, see, he really wanted to know. And I said, well, do you eat cheese? And he said, I do. I just love cheese. And I said, can I show you a short video? And I showed him the video, Dairy is Scary. He said, oh my gosh, I can never touch dairy again. And, you know, sometimes it, it just takes meeting people where they're at. And for him, it was sports and athletics and high performance. And then from there, it's like, okay, let's seal the deal on this. So what do you say to the people who, um, and we, within the vegan community, we have the very, very radical, we have the middle of the road and we have the people that are, oh, it is kind of a fun thing to try. I'm not real committed. And those aren't real vegans as far as I'm concerned, but that's a whole different discussion. But what do you say to the people who say, well, if, something tastes just like real meat. Why would we even do it? So let's talk about that. Yeah. Well, I I don't have to tell you, I get asked that almost every single day, certainly every week, uh, because we're producing products that mimic uh, animal-based proteins and they're meant to do that. And and there's a reason behind that. And the short and skinny of it all is, hey, um, we would love to have every vegan and vegetarian in the world enjoy our products. And I know that's probably not going to happen, but the bigger picture is um, we're a very small percentage of the population, you know, uh, it, less than two hands put together, right? So the bigger portion, the majority portion of the population eat animal-based proteins, um, and they are the ones that have to buy into this. They are the ones that have to say, "Hey, look, I'm open to something that." puts me in my comfort zone while I'm eating. And we all know about comfort food, right? What do you love? Oh, I love macaroni and cheese. I love a good burger. I, you know, you know, all these, I love pizza. I love, Mm -hmm. so if I could make you a burger that tastes almost identical to the burger that you eat every day, that's made from animal-based protein, but I'm going to make it with plant-based protein. Would you try it? Today, Kathleen, and I'm not talking about a couple of years ago, today, I bet you nine out of 10 would say, yeah, I'll give it a try, right? Absolutely. And then, and then out of that nine out of 10, probably eight out of 10 would say, this is more than acceptable. I, I'll eat this. I have no problem with eating this. This tastes good to me, right? And that's the goal here. So uh, look, I, I, I don't battle, look, and I talk to my sales team about this too. I believe we can talk to nine out of 10 people about our products and one out of 10 just doesn't want to listen. So you know what we do? We move on. Right. And we talk to the nine out of 10. I don't have time to try to convince somebody that doesn't want to be convinced, you know, that this is better for themselves. It's better for the environment. It's better for the animal. It's better, 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 better. Right. Absolutely. Look, that's a great opinion. I I love your answer because it, it again, is meeting people where they're at and not trying to force them to make a change, but giving them information, giving them options, and then letting them make the decision that's uh, appropriate for them. Um, Now, I want to talk and go back to what we were originally talking about with health and fitness. And I know that for me, once I went plant-based and I got rid of the, uh, the dairy and the, the animal products, I had more energy. I recovered faster when I went running. Um, and I'm just getting back at my running from my, my broken wrist. Uh, I'm four days into it and I'm up to two miles, very slow miles, but I I have a little apprehension that if I trip and fall, I'm going to re-break my wrist, but that's my own, uh, Uh, my own block, but quite seriously, um, what do you, uh, what do you most enjoy with exercise? And did you notice an improvement in your health? I I know your numbers got much better, but as far as energy and all that, when you went plant-based, a a couple of things I noticed right away. Uh, I slept better. Mm -hmm. I, 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 when I go to sleep, I'm asleep and I sleep. If it's six hours, I sleep six hours and I wake up in the morning and I, I wake up refreshed, not groggy and tired. Uh, so that was really noticeable to me. Um, when it comes to working out, I, I've always been fairly uh, athletic. Um, you know, when I turned 50, 
I, uh, I ran 12 marathons in 12 months. That was my goal. Oh my uh, gosh. Yeah. And, uh, it, look, it wasn't that easy, but I, I did it. And, and when I set a goal for myself, I usually accomplish that. Um, this is what I love. I go to the gym five days a week. Um, sometimes I struggle a little bit when I'm traveling uh, because the gyms obviously at the hotels aren't as great as the gym that I go to. But uh, if I'm in town, I go every single morning to the gym five days. Uh, and then on the weekends, I'll usually go for a hike. I stay active even on the mm -hmm. weekends. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to run, but um, the knees get a little beat down after a while. And I decided uh, I'll, I'll do a little more strength training. Um, but I love going to the gym and working out next to other guys or even women that are in their 20s and 30s and either keeping up with them or being ahead of them. I and get that's it. my motivation. <laughs> I love that. I absolutely get it because I actually, every year since I, I turned 60, when I turned 60, my, my goal was a marathon. I did it and came in dead last, but I, I finished. Right. Uh, I am definitely not a fast runner, but every year I've had a goal of what I'm going to do. And I turned 67 in May and it was like, what am I going to do for my 67th birthday? Well, I broke my wrist. And oh. so I'm, I'm planning for when I'm completely healed and what I can do. And I've, I put it out to uh, my Facebook group and I said, what should I do? And I had people say skydive. It's like, oh, I'm scared of a three foot ladder. But I had somebody who said, why don't you do 67 five Ks? And it's like, oh, I could do that easily. And I do that every day anyway. So, um, you know, I love the fact that being plant-based gives us the energy to do what we want do. So in closing, Danny, what, what are your thoughts for people as we move forward with what's going on in the world with people's health, with the environment, with the animals, what can you uh, leave them with that could possibly help them have an awareness that maybe they're willing to try things a little bit differently? Yeah. Uh, Kathleen, it's really simple. Uh, just be open and listen. And that, that's all I really ask. Um, you know, I don't, I don't spend any time preaching uh, because I don't think it gets you anywhere. Uh, but certainly when somebody comes to me and, and asks me about what I've done and, and why I did it and, and how it affected me uh, and maybe even how it affects the people that surround me that I care about, um, it, it's a topic I'd love to talk about. So I, I, I say to people today, we have something here uh, that you and I didn't have when we were young and growing up. And it's a computer in our hand, right? So instantaneously, you've got information. Unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation out there. So keep yourself open, be realistic, understand what's real and what isn't. And if you don't get it, ask. Uh, I, I think that uh, today we just, you know, sometimes we close ourselves up too fast, mm -hmm. uh, or we believe in something too quickly, uh, and we don't educate ourselves. Um, I, I, I still read the newspaper, the physical paper, every single morning, probably about a half hour. And I'm not, I'm not good at, at reading, reading. Like I, I can't sit down and read a book because it's just, I, I can't focus that long. But if I can read something in 10 or 15 minutes, I'm going to read it. So I'm always always educating myself. And I think everybody should do that. You, you don't have to read the newspaper. You can pick, pick up your phone and, and read things on, on your phone um, because there's a lot of information out there. And be realistic when you're reading or learning because most of us have really, really good common sense. If it doesn't seem real, it probably isn't. Right. True. True. So uh, there's a lot of really great information about what we do as vegans out there. And, and you mentioned a couple of the uh, uh, videos that are out. Uh, I don't know. Do we use the term video anymore? Uh, you know, documentaries that are out there uh, about um, animal cruelty and uh, very specific uh, pieces of the uh, food industry. Uh, whether it be the beef industry or the dairy industry or, 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 or chicken, poultry or, or fish, uh, you know, all, every one of them has a documentary for every piece of the, of the food industry that would help to educate. For some people, it's going to be extreme. It's going to be upsetting. Mm -hmm. uh, but 
it's important that you understand uh, what we do. Am animal ag agriculture today is is pretty cruel. It is. Um, it is. No and, doubt. And um, understanding that and keeping open to your options will make all the difference in the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Danny. And I want to remind people, this is Kathleen Gage with Vegan Visibility Podcast Show. And I've had the distinct pleasure of talking with Danny O'Malley of Before the Butcher. And Danny, how do people get in touch with you? Uh, you know, one of the best ways is just to go to our website, btbfoods.com. And um, you can you can reach me through the website. We have different links on the website, even an 800 number on the website that you can reach out um, and take a look at what we do. We, we have some amazing products. You can order all of it uh, online and we're in various different uh, retail stores across the country. And you'll see that if you go to our website. Excellent. Well, this has been delightful, Danny. Thank you so much. I wish you the greatest success and keep doing what you're doing. You're out there making a difference. This is Kathleen Gage wishing you a great day. Go out, be healthy, be kind to the animals and to the environment. You've been listening to the Vegan Visibility Podcast Show. Be sure to subscribe to get notified when the next episode is live. And we always appreciate reviews. Join us next time for more inspiration, education, and motivation to build your business one cruelty-free and healthy person at a time.